Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Wednesday, April 4th, 2012, and our special guest is Howard Rheingold to talk about his new book, NetSmart. Howard, thanks so much for being here again. To be Howard's people. Well, Future of well education my intention is, is to talk uh, to a lot of different people about this, which I, I, I'm doing, and it's and it's pleasant to talk to an audience that's already pretty clueful. Collaborate for providing this room. We are celebrating the fifth anniversary of Classroom 2.0 with a number of really fun activities, and one of which is uh, Ed Incubator. Uh, our first Ed Incubator group is the PBS News Hour, getting feedback from teachers on their projects. We also have a book project. Also coming up uh, at ISTE, we have ISTE Unplugged which is our set of crowdsourced shadow activities around the ISTE conference. It starts with an all-day unconference on Saturday that used to be called EduBloggerCon, is now called Social EdCon. It's really a blast. It is free to attend. Uh, you don't even need to be attending ISTE to come to Social EdCon, but then through the rest of the conference we have all kinds of fun activities, including a place for those who didn't get accepted to present to actually present to a live audience and streamed. So do come to ISTEunplugged.com to find out more. Coming up on April 21st is our first ever Social Learning Summit. This is a terrific opportunity uh, sponsored by Discovery Education. We are crowdsourcing uh, sessions, half hour sessions, on the use of social media and Web 2.0 in education. Go to sociallearningsummit.com. We still have a few more days while we're accepting proposals. We have just an incredible lineup of teachers and educators and others who are presenting on all kinds of really great topics. It will be free Saturday, April 21st. Please do join us. Our second library, Future of Libraries conference is October 3rd through 5th at libraries 2.012, or sorry, library2012.com or library20.com to find out more. And then our third global, ed, global education conference will be the 12th to 16th of November. That's at globaledcon.com. Uh, also coming up without date yet, but committed are a gaming and education virtual conference and an alternative education conference. We're really having fun planning these events. Hope you enjoy them. Coming up on the Future of Education tomorrow, Joseph Granny, one of the co-authors of uh, Crucial Conversations, Crucial Conventations, um, Influencer and Change Anything is going to come talk about the work that they've done on social learning uh, as it relates uh, to connections with education. Really, really interesting material. We had one of his compatriots come on and talk about humanitarian work some months back and education projects. On April 10th, Jennifer Fox talks about uh, the problems with traditional content. Mark Tucker is going to talk about the OECD work and comparing countries and surpassing Shanghai. Bound to be interesting, that one. Uh, Tracy Willen Dalgenti is going to talk about Society 3.0. John Hunter on his World Peace and other fourth grade achievements. You can see a really fun schedule of people coming up. Hopefully something that you'll want to join us for. If you've missed the show, they are all recorded. Uh, we heard last week from Dick Gale on positive deviance and um, other really interesting activities coming out of the uh, California Teachers Association Institute for Teaching, I think it's called. Alec Koros talked to us before that about social learning. David Warlick had just a great conversation with him. Kathy Davidson on her new book. Anyway, lots up there. Please hope that you'll, I, I hope you'll find something worthwhile there. Okay, so I'm going to give you permissions to modify the map. Let me do that. You sh you're looking for some icons to the left of the map. The second icon down, the star, if you double click on it, you can then click on the map. It's also fun to do a shout out in the chat to let us know where you're participating from.
It's got to be late in Europe. But we do appreciate your attending. New Zealand. Singapore, probably. I haven't looked at the list here. Who's here? Oh, Japan. I, I was a, a little off there, wasn't I? Oh, and Brazil, always a favorite for me. Well, wherever you're participating from or if you're listening to the recording, we sure do appreciate it. I love it. this. So, so, Howard, at the top of the show, before we were actually started, I told you that this is uh, a book that I plan to go through in great detail with my children, my own children. Um, I think in part what I really loved about this book was the incredible depth. This is more than just kind of a primer for those who are interested in what's right and wrong about the internet. There, there are some there's some incredibly deep conversation here, and I, for one, really appreciate um, what you've done with this book. Uh, I don't think is it actually out yet. It is out. I, I do, oh, I bought it from Amazon, so it is. It out. is. It, it, it's been shipping for the last two weeks, so it's taken a while to get to some places physically. But you can now get it shipped from Amazon, or you can find it in some bookstores. It's, so we're going to end up talking tonight about the. We're, we're going to end up talking tonight about the five fundamental literacies, I think, in some depth. But before we go there. It felt to me like there were three sort of larger themes to the book, and I want to explore them with you and see if they map to your own sense or if you can kind of guide us to, to a better understanding. One was this kind of combination of uh, individualism and community and how both are being redefined and how important both are. So good. You want to take these one at a time? Yeah, so sure. So uh, clearly on the individual side, there's this um, shift to for you to mindfulness and personal empowerment and kind of dealing with the new strategies. But there's also this contribution to the commons that seems so important. Boy, you really get this book. I, I can't wait to see what the, the next two themes are. But, you know, I think that's what I have perceived to be the most important and, and powerful axis, that of how am I going to survive, how am I going to do better, and how are we all going to, to do better. And you know, from the beginning, from when I started writing about virtual communities in the 1980s, what has excited me is, is not that it's some kind of hive mind in which we lose our individuality, nor that it's, it's just a, a, a lever for self-promotion. It's a way that people can act in our self-interest in a way that adds up to something for others. And I think that that is a magical power the way the, the alphabet was a, a magical power. We now have the power to multiply uh, the abilities of our individual minds by the collective. And that doesn't mean that we're getting directions from from someone. Collectivism is enforced. But we're all doing this because we're literate. We've learned how to do it. And, and we're doing it with others online. And we're creating stuff together that, that individually empowers us, but also adds up to something big. But also, there's just a strictly pragmatic value proposition when you write a, a, a book. It, reading a book is a, a big commitment. A person wants to know what they're going to get out of it. And, and I want to make sure that both of those aspects of it get across. This will help you. If you know this, you will do better. You will be happier. But also, here's how we can improve the commons, the digital commons for, for everybody by knowing how to do this stuff. So although I'm accused of being an optimist, I'm actually not. I'm, I'm hopeful. And what hope means is, well, what kind of tools might we use to solve the problems we face, even though they, they may seem insurmountable. And I have to say that the amount of, of crap and not knowing what the heck you're doing online and the people who do know what they're doing and who are attempting and succeeding at manipulating others. And that's that kind, kind of feels disempowering when you look at all that. So what do you do about it? Well, I think spreading cluefulness is what you do about it. Well, I love that phrase, spreading cluefulness. It, it felt to me like the hope in the book 
is both a recognition of the potential and of the dangers at this moment of time that exists both at the individual and at the community level. Um, it feels like there's an undercurrent of concern in the book. There is an undercurrent of concern. And, and an old friend of mine once accused me of having a template for a Howard Rheingold book, which is, here are these new wonderful powers, but here are the, here are the dangers that are seeking to enclose them. And so maybe that's true, but I, I think it's also part of trying to perceive technology and our own personal uses of technologies and particularly our, our, our practices with communication media to look at those things critically and, re and reflectively and not uh, mindlessly. And, and I think that if you do that, it's clear that there are problems that, that social media afford distraction. Maybe you should be looking at and talking to your child instead of your Blackberry. And that's a, a dilemma that we uh, all face uh, these days. And then it, there's just a, well, you can see I, I agree so far. I have to say the last chapter of the book took me to a place that I wasn't expecting at that point, but was really, really powerful me, for me. So there's the potential and danger for the individual, and I think that's sort of a, a territory that we're pretty familiar with. That last chapter said to me there's a sense of urgency here that we may already have lost some fights with regard to uh, privacy and motives and information. So we really have to band together to start using these tools thoughtfully to combat what are going to be sort of natural commercial and government interests to co-opt the technologies. Absolutely. I'm, I'm considered an optimist because I, I advocate for individual knowledge and collective action by all of the people who use and benefit from this medium on the assumption that the, the big uh, government and, and corporate forces that are seeking to enclose it through many different uh, political and, and technical means that I, I'm assuming that they haven't already won. And today I was looking back through some things I wrote back in the 1990s at a syndicated column called Tomorrow that was about the future. And I ranted and, and raved in 1994 and 1995 about giving our privacy away. In, in the book, you'll see at the last chapter, I say that it's really hard to put something in a paper published book about the latest thing you have to do about Facebook. But you can be sure that they will change the, they will move the, the boundaries of privacy without asking you. And the default where you have to go change those privacy settings will, will be buried in your, your settings. What happens is that people accept it and it becomes a norm and the definition of privacy changes. There, remember there's a big uproar about the news feed when it first came out that being able to know what your friends were doing, that what, was, what others were writing on their wall, that that was so, sort of okay, but to have it syndicated so that you could read it on your phone at any moment, that, that seemed a real transgression years ago, and now everybody accepts that. And so the, the same thing's true with video cameras, networked video cameras. We now got augmented reality goggles. All of these threats to what we used to know as privacy have been coming for a while, and and for the most part, people have not been interested in them until it's kind of too late. So I, I, I'm more of a, a pessimist about the privacy stuff. Yeah, I live in California, for example, where the, the state legislature has failed three times to pass a, a bill just making it an opt-out, no, an opt-in for bank customers. The big banks in California can sell your data to, to anyone um, legitimately, and it's buried somewhere on the eighth page of your, your phone bill, how to have to opt out of it. But, you know, there will always be more force concentrated on, on keeping the ability to exploit privacy uh, legitimate than there are for the, the, the people who object to it, or, or that's the way it appears. So I think the one place where there is leverage is all of the people who don't know that they can turn off some of those things in Facebook. They may be tracked by others, no matter what, what you do. If your phone is on, no matter whether you're talking to someone, 
someone with the right amount of power can get to you and know exactly where you are in an instant. That's just a, a reality. Video cameras recognize who people are. That's the world we live in. In the world online, there are at least some choices about how much you are disclosing about yourself. I think the fundamental issue is how much you know about what you're disclosing. I get left the book with the sense of there being kind of a digital imperative that those of us who are becoming familiar with these technologies need to be talking about how to use them in intelligent, humane, and mindful ways, and then really helping to spread that word so that we establish uh, early on, or as early as we can, uses that will sort of perpetuate through um, the, online, uh, sort of the online world we live in for the next decades. I, you know, I think that, that we are at a moment where um, the amount of cluefulness um, can make a difference. I think that the, the reaction to the SOPA and, and PIPA online that actually changed the way Congress was going to pass a law is a sign that there is some leverage there. You notice I'm very, being very careful of, uh, about my language here because I don't want to try to come off as techno-utopian. I'm, I'm sort of a techno-realist. Techno, the how do you do the best you can given the circumstances. And I also think that the circumstances are pretty good for the knowledgeable. I mean, it's more than pretty good. It's a, it's a mind amplifier. It's a, a collective intelligence. There's a, a positive side to all of this that, that I really derived from Tim O'Reilly's Architectures of Participation when he talked about the way the web affords the, the accretion of useful public goods that are useful to everybody through self-interested acts. Every time we, we make a link or we, we curate something on, on a blog or a, with a curation tool, every time we add a little bit of an intelligence to that flow of information out there, we are increasing the capability of the commons to provide uh, value to ourselves. Although I'll have to say, I was just so I was just looking at stuff that I wrote in 1994 about the first spammers and our, our worst nightmares back, back then in 1994 about where this would lead to was, have been surpassed. And the counter spam has done a pretty good job of keeping it out of our face. But it's a, it's a whole tragedy of the commons that we're seeing unfold. Let's jump into the five fundamental literacies. Your goal here is to help identify what we can do to empower individuals and improve the digital culture for everybody. Um, you know, one of the first things that occurred to me looking at the five digital literacies is, uh, fundamental literacies was, um, how important it's going to be to help educators feel an understanding of these themselves in their own lives for them to be able to communicate it to students. This all started for me, started thinking about a, a prescriptive book when I was first started teaching students. So um, the, we're all faced with uh, the dilemma between the attraction that social media has on our attention and, and other things, such as our need to focus for the next 20 minutes, or that's my child speaking to me, I probably should put the, the Blackberry down. There are attention issues that, that permeate our lives. But in the classroom, you stand up and you see the students. You know, in fact, I've got a picture of that with their, with their um, permission. I. Uh, took videos of my students. This is really, you can tell, the early years of my teaching because the, the chairs weren't in a circle yet. So I, I uh, realized that they didn't know what it looked like from where I stood looking at them, looking at their laptops. So I made a movie of them. And then I put a camera at the back of the room, again, with their permission. And they knew that this was happening. And I looked at this student. I was projecting the video at the front of the room. And he was uh, looking at the video on his laptop for some reason. And then he, uh, he switches to my private web page and my public web page. And then he, he goes back to doing his email. I started thinking about attention in the, the classroom and arrived at this idea of, of uh, 
mindfulness or metacognition from dealing with the students. What can we do about this? Can we manage our attention more effectively? And the uh, social scientist down the hall from me, Cliff Nass, has done uh, research in the last couple of years on media multitasking that pretty much shows that when you think you're be being more effective multitasking, you're actually being less effective in the individual tasks. There's a beginning to be some empirical knowledge about how our use of information technologies um, and our attention are, are co-evolving. I'm, again, I'm in the in the education world, we we believe that you can learn how to manage these things. You can learn how to think more effectively about how to use your attention. And I think we all can. The more I looked into it, the more it seemed that that was a fundamental need for the students, but also for the rest of us. We need to reflect on it. And and so, what are the tools for doing something about it? I I think there's an enormous amount of information and polemic about information overload and distraction and Quick trance. Uh, these these are and these are all real dilemmas, real pitfalls. I'm concentrating on okay, what do you do? And I think the, the good news about that is just a little bit of thinking about how you are deploying your attention when you're using media and what your alternatives at that moment might be is uh, highly effective. So I build the other literacies on on attention. You got you got got to have some thinking about how you are deploying your uh, attention if you're going to do crap detection, participation, collaboration, or, or network know-how. So part of what I love this about the story of that student watching the video online is and switching to his email is that I think you, you indicate that he was actually one of your best students. And that part of what we're doing here is helping people develop their own self-management skills, which in a lot of ways is a recognition of agency by the student. And so it was interesting for me that that attention chapter kind of turned into a sense of the importance of helping develop agency within students. You know, that's what I learned from the students. That's what they, they taught me was, so how are we going to look at this attention stuff? The, the laptop in the classroom is a real issue. It's, a, it's a, an occasion for denial or you could shut it down, but in my case, I'm teaching social media, so we had to reflect on it. We had to, to, to face it, and the issue became, so what, what do we know about beginning to manage it? How do we begin to, to manage it? And so I learned a lot from that, and that was the framework within which I began working on my own attention and began looking into what other people know, the scholarly, the scientific, the, the practitioner, about what to do, and it turns out there are people who know what to do, and it's it's not that complicated. It's just that all of these little bits of lore. Infotension is infotension. So, infotension is what I came up with when I started thinking about combining the attentional processes, the attentional training, the management that I'm I'm talking about, the self awareness of how you're deploying your attention and the, making decisions about it, applying that to the, the information sphere. So we all need to make uh, a lot of decisions very quickly online and for the most part uh, that's not something we've been trained to do and we pretty much automatically click on the cute cat video when we really need to be doing something else and, and I think Social media afford distraction, but don't compel it. That we all need to learn how to make those decisions in in light of what our priorities are. So, uh, for example, looking into um, how do you really go about changing your ability to make these decisions? I uh, came upon this. Uh, I didn't invent this, but it's it, it really works. Um, every every morning, I write down, and you can see three different lines, six words, what I expect to accomplish that day, and every once in a while my my vision falls upon that piece of paper, and I think about what I'm doing at the moment, just as, as simple as that. So I think just training ourselves to think about whether we're going to click on something or open a tab for it or, uh, or, or tag it and bookmark it for much later, that, the, that doing those, making those decisions more deliberately and making them more quickly is the, the first step. And I, I also talk about using various tools like um, 
like RSS readers to uh, enable people to, to, to match their attention to their tool set. So I put the most relevant for today in the moment in the upper left, and there are days when I only look in, at the, the left and the top part of my uh, dashboard. And there are times when I just roam through it because that's what I want to do that day is to just to learn learn things. And and sometimes I think you need to be unfocused, but I think it's important to know when to focus. I think you make a great case for attention being that first literacy that in a world of uh, uh, what's almost going to become uh, unlimited information that we need to be both teaching ourselves and helping others to learn about attention. Your next literacy is critical consumption or crap detection. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, because uh, you know once once you have some handle on being able to to, to manage your attention to, to your own priorities to some degree, then you you're faced with the Again, it's the opportunity and the and the and the pitfall. You can get the answer to any question if you can ask it uh, properly, and you can do that from just about anywhere these days. It's like magic. It's like a magic spell. You put the right words together, you get the 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 answer. But it's it's up to you to determine whether you're getting good information, bad information, misinformation, disinformation. As I I tell the story in my book, it really started with trying to tell my daughter when she was in middle school about how things had changed now that she did her research with search engines as well as library books. So I've also had some experience with health issues online, and I think anybody who's had anything serious going on with them has Googled their symptoms, has Googled their disease. That's really life or death. I think in the political sphere, the health of democracy is going to depend on how many people are clueful enough to check whether the scurrilous political rumor is true or not. If, I think if we fall below a, a certain percentage of people who do the, even just the most elementary fact checking, um, it's going to be grievous for everybody. So. We're really in the early years of everybody being able to publish anything and search engines showing you things that may not necessarily be accurate. The, the, the different methods for determining and um, valuing, evaluating a information that we find online and the time that we have amount to, to, to do it, they aren't really taught either, although again, it's not rocket science. It's, it's not even the multiplication tables. It's, it's you know it's fairly simple stuff, but knowing that a few simple tools are really useful online, if you do them at all, like looking for an author and googling the author's name, it's it's as simple as that, and and not using just one search engine or looking at the first page of search or stopping with one search, really simple stuff. I think it begins to add up to value online. I, I get into a lot more detail about more sophisticated issues about crowdsourcing, um, curation of, of information online. And I, and I think that there's some important issues ab about kind of the, the herd immunity that, that comes from the aggregation of individual crop detection skills online. So I think this is all important, again, for individuals, but also for the, the, the commons. It feels to me as though one of the great benefits of the new online world is almost a renaissance in critical consumption. I almost feel as though uh, I wasn't taught well to be a critical consumer of content uh, until I had to teach myself to do it w online. And I feel as though um, this is uh, actually taking us to an even better place. Now, I mean, I know that there are lots of dangers here, but for me, this is a huge positive. It's a sort of the ability that the web gives me to be a critical consumer of information, as I actually think has enhanced my uh, my greater abilities. The tools are there, and the tools are you know we overlook how magical they are. Search when it came along at all was, was magical. The, the, the raw concatenation of tools that are free, except for the exchange of our private information and our attention, 
are just in, in, enormously powerful. We can do all kinds of things with it. Again, this has all happened so fast in the digital sphere and, and with network publics that the kinds of thinking that had always been taught as critical thinking have not been widely applied to the education about uh, critical consumption of information online. And you know, there's some good empirical research out there. There's um, a significant amount of experimentation in practice. And I just I tried to bring these, all of those things together to bear, again, for a, an intelligent parent like you, who, who and, and you're pretty well informed. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that there are people who are not as well informed as everyone who's participating in this, but who will want to go to the, the book as a, a guide for what they're, they're going to do with their students and their, their children. I actually, my first thought on completing the book was, I want to hold a local book reading group with all of my friends and go through I'm sorry, this can you chapter by that? chapter. I'm sorry, you, 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 you said your first thought, and then I had to jump out. I really want to take this book, and I want to gather with some friends and go through it chapter by chapter, because I know many of my friends are trying to figure out sort of the impact of these technologies on their lives and their children's lives. And then my next thought was, well, we should do it online. And I mean, it's sort of immediately magnified to all of these different ways of going through this. OK, so uh, literacy number three was participation. And uh, this really rang deeply true to me, which is in a world in which an enormous number of people have devices that allow for the creation of content, that it's really important to recognize the connection between participation and power and the importance of learning to participate. Absolutely. You know, I use some um, examples in the in the book um, when I talk about uh, participation. Maybe I'll just flash them really quickly here. So there was Heather Lover. She she shut down the Warner Brothers uh, attorneys who were trying to shut down the Harry Potter website uh, fan website uh, by organizing a worldwide Warner Brothers boycott in just a few days before they figured out she was uh, 16 years old. Uh, Bev Harris, obscure blogger, found the source code for voting machines online, made it public, and eventually a, won a court case. The uh, whale Gonim, one of the faces of the, the, the revolution in Egypt, in which social media literacies played an important role. Um, teenagers starting industries in their, their dorm rooms. I think, you know, I, I really like uh, Ross. Uh, um, Mayfield's uh, power law of participation, in which he talks about how easy it is to enter with a very low threshold, like just reading a blog or or, or liking something or plusing something or tagging something, and how you can become more and more engaged with others in all the way up to the the scale of global encyclopedias and other uh, worldwide collective efforts. Um, pretty easily. It's again as the the resources that are available to us, the number of different ways to to participate are just you know they multiply daily. So I I, I may have sounded a little bit uh, gloomy about the the prospects that we that are the dangers, but I think that the tools the I don't want to use the word weapons, the, the things that, that people can use to do things on all kinds of scales are proliferating. So knowing how to participate I think is is all important and I had assumed that my, my students would be these digital natives we hear so much about. But it turns out that that for the most part there are always a couple of students who know more than I do about part of this. For the for the most part, there's a, a, a pretty wide range of, of of literacy among people who can text with one hand behind their back and 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 uh, Facebook for hours a day. That doesn't mean they know how to use a a, a blog to advocate or a wiki to to organize. Uh, so uh, there's I think a lot of room for at a pretty low cost in improving our 
our skills, as, again, as individuals, but also I think when we add the number of people who are more adept at doing these things, we, we improve the collective intelligence that's available to, to all of us who know how to use it. Howard, but I want to ask you to contrast the power law of participation and the long tail. Because the long tail has, for, for a long time for us, um, represented that 80% of the content would come from 20% of the users, or or 80% of the um, the product would come from 20% of the manufacturers. But does the power law of participation shift the long tail? If Amazon's selling more books in the long tail than get sold in traditional bookstores, does the power law of participation shift the long tail? You know, I think a better way to think about it is if you look at so you look at this as a long tail here, and, and take away the other stuff, and you and you you um, look at that gray area as a, a densely connected network. Then Beth Harris was an obscure blogger, um, but the information she had it climbed all the way up that that long tail to the the power bloggers. So yes, there's always going to be, I think, a minority of people who get most of the the attention, and that does seem to be somewhat structural. But online, well, we're we're learning that those who are not among the 20% contribute a huge, an enormous amount. If there's a whole lot of them, and they each do a little something, we wouldn't have. Uh, Search engines, if it wasn't for people put, putting links on their on their blogs. So again, this architecture of participation here, taken together with the, with, with the last of the five literacies, the uh, uh, knowledge of how things spread in networks and how to spread them in networks, makes it that climb up the long tail very, very quick in some circumstances. So I think that that we we need to keep in mind that most of the work is done by a small amount of people, and that most of the attention is is cultivated by a small number of people. But if everybody else does a little something, we well, open source, in the open source world, it's, it's known that a lot of people who are free writers on what the programmers do actually improve open source by Enlarging the user base, making it, giving it more more power to those who are, are um, building it. But also, if you ever complain about a bug once, and you multiply that by millions of people who only do do something once, you've actually got millions of signals. So there's a, I think that there's a, a real, um, and I think well designed amplification of our ability to to do things through networks. Um, online. Again, it's not automatic. The technology doesn't do it. You need to know how to do it. I didn't want to leave the um, participation discussion without mentioning to me one of the great benefits of this world of participation, which is the ability for individuals to develop kind of individual worth within the larger ecosystem in very natural ways. And thinking about how that would impact our a need to help students understand how to represent themselves and the particularly unique skills and talents and bridging capabilities that they have in a world in which many more people are participants. Well, I'm I am a, a believer in what, what Henry Jenkins and, and Mimi Ito and and others uh, call participatory culture, which is the the notion that if just as it happened with using computers to communicate, you know, there were a bunch of enthusiasts, tens of thousands of them, using things like Usenet in 1980. But now that we've got 2 billion people online, that quantitative change is made for a qualitative change. And a participatory culture is one in which all of these people online, a significant portion of the, of the human species, if, if they think of themselves individually as not just passive consumers of culture that's created by others, but in, even in some small way, a creator of, and a participant in the creation of culture, then they have a different sense of agency. And they think of themselves as citizens in a different way than a citizen who is strictly a consumer of, of culture, and we're all consumers of culture created by others, but because we've got these digital factories in our, our pockets and we've got these networks that instantaneously distribute it 
all over the world, the the ability to do that is no longer confined, and that makes for a a, a much richer, noisier. I'm trying to help reduce the noise, but it might, makes a, a a much, I think, healthier culture. And what we're working out now are the the, the conflicts that are not healthy, and how are we going to live with the um, the conflicts? So there's not going to be enough time to go nearly as deep as I would enjoy for each topic. But let's move on to cooperation. And one of the intriguing elements of cooperation for me was this concept of self-election uh, and, and how maybe we change our sense of how people do cooperate given the capabilities of the technology. Well, you know, I discover things by stumbling on them and then inquiring into them. So when I started looking at the different forms of collaboration online, and in, in one sense it's, it's um, something that I've been uh, doing for a long time, I, I, I looked at the, what research I could find about why open source works and found a great book uh, by, uh, called The Success of Open Source by Professor Stephen Weber, and I looked him up. And if you, if you survey and observe populations of open source programmers, uh, they do things, uh, they multiply their efforts in a number of ways because of the way the system works. And one, one way the system works, which is the same way it works on Wikipedia, is that instead of having any kind of centralized management of labor, people decide what they want to do. I'm, I'm the expert on a particular ant, and I'm going to write the Wikipedia page about that, or um, I have a new printer, and I'm going to write a driver for it and, and make that part of the public code. So I think this ability for people to select what it is that they want to do isn't going to, it isn't going to work for producing everything. But so far, it's worked on producing some really interesting things. I think there are more interesting things to come. So self-election, I think along with, I put a, a, a slide up about scratching an itch. If you do something like bookmarking that you have to do for yourself anyway, and through the architecture of something like a social bookmarking or a curation service, you are able to, to make your choices available to others. Uh, you are doing something in your own interest that adds up to be something useful to others and to you, to reciprocally comes back to you. Like scratching an itch more than, than Cory Doctorow's phrase for <laughs> those ways in which, by our participation, we actually are building the very tool that we're using. But uh, I did find your discussion of curation really, really good. OK, so we're, again, in the interest of time, going to move on because the network know-how piece here, this chapter, uh, for me, was, was one that I just could not I had to read word for word because of my involvement in, in uh, communities and networks. Um, uh, I'm interested in the gift economy piece here. And I wondered if, uh, as part of the dangers of this moment, um, are we seeing some loss in the gift economy? Is that one of the potential dangers of the commercialization of these technologies? Boy, I guess we, we don't really have time to get into all of that, and I, because I think that there are multiple dimensions here. One of them is we have a tremendous gift economy. I'm going to put some photographs that I have up and tag them, and others who need those images have them instantly available. That's fantastic. At the same time, there are there's the real issue of commodification and um, an ex exploitation of labor. So uh, having your, your um, personal production be more and more of a, a commodity that's in, in the monetary marketplace has, has, its, uh, has its corrosive aspects, both on individuals and, and uh, societies. I'm sorry, where was I going with that? No, but we'll, we'll keep going because this was just a brilliant chapter for me. Um, and you bring out the, the importance of diversity and the um, uh, network knowledge and the role of diversity in network knowledge. Do you want to talk about that? 
Well, you know, again, uh, some of this comes from my time online and my instincts. I think this is really the first book I've written in which I am a primary expert that I interviewed, although you'll, you'll see um, um, f far from from uh, the only one. And um, just knowing about how, knowing a lot of the different things that are Again, not rocket science, but they come from a lot of different places. And put, putting those things together in a, a way that makes sense to me was a a great discovery. But, you know, doing the stumbling over this stuff and then inquiring into it le led me to see a lot of connections between small pieces of knowledge. That that n none of this is you know p particularly new. What the the interconnection of these things and knowing little bits and pieces about what sociologists know and network scientists know and and people who are studying uh, digital economics know it becomes very useful for for people but playbor uh you can look that up is the exploitation of people's networked efforts by others with or or without much of their knowledge i think the the game that Louis Van Aan invented that, that Google bought was a good one. It's a, a game where uh, two players are shown a an image and they try to find out a word that describes it and they don't move on to the next one until they find one that they agree upon. So that's actually a game that millions of people played. It also increased the capabilities and the value of, of Google's uh, own uh, visual recognition. So the uh, idea that you can improve the stock price of Yahoo by tagging your photos is there's an argument that your your labor is being ex exploited by others. For for me, the answer to that argument is informed consent. Again, it comes down to what people know. Do you? I consent to Flickr using my decisions to. Uh, increase its value because it's valuable to me, and I I would have to pay a lot more to to preserve just my my exclusive right to to my labor. So I think that there's there are arguments to be made about that, but I think that there's we're in, moving into a, a world in which the the forces of of turning our behavior and our, our privacy into commodities that that others can profit from, I think that's something that we all need to know about. There's a um, you spend a little bit of time in the book talking about um, the uh, the detailed description of individuals who will thrive in emerging the emerging network environment, um, delineated by Rainey and Wellman. And I thought that list might be a great list for people who are looking for sort of specific educational places to focus. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, was that a book, or was it an article? I, could, I don't remember. Uh, so uh, Lee Rainey is the director of the Pew Internet and American Life uh, Research Project. And Barry Wellman is the most uh, cited uh, sociologist in, in Canada. So th these are people who have been studying empirically, one of them through uh, sociology research and the other one through um, scientific polling. They've been looking at how networks work. And they've got a book that's coming out soon, again, from MIT Press, same person who's, uh, same publisher as, as NetSmart. So because I know them both, I interviewed them both while I was writing my book. And of course, I looked at I looked at a lot of other literature. There's a very famous paper by a Stanford professor on the the strength of weak ties. And so again, little pieces of knowledge from a lot of different places. Uh, Mark Smith, uh, formerly with Microsoft Research, he's the one who tutored me on social network analysis as as, as something that individuals could use or ought to know something about. So, you, I don't know. Do we have time for me to go through these things? Do. We're going to sort of shift the Q&A at this point. So if you have a question for Howard while he's talking, please feel free to put it in the chat or to raise your hand. That's the uh, hand icon in the participant window. So feel free to go wherever you'd like to go, Howard. And, um, and I have a couple more questions for you if we need them. 
I think let's go to the interactive part. So I guess you want to do you want to uh -huh. uh, moderate Terrific. that, Steve, or shall I just take questions from the chat or what? I will. So Monica is saying Smart Mobs is an excellent read, of course, and smartmobs.com you can go to. Um, if you have a question for Howard, please feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. That's the hand icon, the third icon over in the participant window. While we're waiting, Howard, are we at a sort of a schizophrenic moment with employers? Some employers are going to like these character traits of the networked individual, and others are going to want much more compliant behavior. How does a teacher address the fact that their students are going into a marketplace that is widely divergent um, interests in employees? You know, I think that the the kind of places that that students want to work are are the ones that that live in, in and take advantage of the way the world is now. So um, there there are going to be conflicts with companies that don't want to, to change face to, to to deal with the environment. You know, we've been through this many times before. Uh, the personal computer and the internet did not come into the workplace because they were authorized by top management. They were brought into the workplace by you know mostly young but not entirely young but but first you know early adopters who decided that, that spreadsheets or Usenet were useful to them. And in fact, if you want to take that further, uh, I wrote about this in Tools for Thought in 1985, I think. If engineers at competing companies had not used Usenet without their boss's knowledge to learn how to do things, then we probably wouldn't have seen the way Silicon Valley grew since the, the, the 1980s when Usenet was first used. So I think um, there's a, a certain delayed value in understanding the way boundaries have shifted. Annalise Axenian wrote about that when she wrote about the uh, competitive advantage that Silicon Valley had over Route 128. Open, open technology systems, open hardware and software systems, but also open social networks. Okay, so um, here's a question. I heard today that in elementary school, students now face each other rather than the teacher, since students are now learning more from each other rather than the teacher. Where does the teacher fit into this in the future? Which I'm guessing opens a nice little door for you in terms of peer learning, right? Well, I, you know, it goes in two directions. One is that there, there are teachers, there always will be teachers, and just as you know, there always will be people who, who have a passion for for writing or or doing something else, and I think that the, the teacher is no longer just the transfer of knowledge. I see the the teacher today in a, in a very exciting way as the facilitator of learning communities, and and part of that has to do with the, the kind of guidance that teachers give. They 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 show we show what the boundaries are so that people don't, don't get vertigo. They don't have to try to invent the world. We, we point them towards steps that they can take. We guide their inquiry. But I think by sitting down from the, the lectern and taking those rows of desks and putting them in a circle and guiding, but staying largely out of a collaborative inquiry is, to me, a really exciting way of teaching students both in the face-to-face -face and, the, and the online world. And this is a, a this kind of peer, including the peers in the teaching and the learning and encouraging them to inquire and construct knowledge together. These are not new ideas. They go back to John Dewey, the Vygotsky, the Ferreira. It's just that the, the technology and the, the digital media themselves and the networks that, that transmit the digital media afford that kind of extension of the face-to-face -face classroom that, that was never possible before. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Oh, back to diversity. Um, diverse networks are collectively smarter. So one of the people I looked at was Tom Malone, who started this, the Center for Collective Intelligence at the Sloan School of Business at, at MIT, has done empirical research on what you could, uh, to, to oversimplify, describe as the collective IQ of a group, its ability to solve uh, specifiable problems that you can study together. And that networks that have greater diversity are, tend to be of greater value in these circumstances. That is, if you take 
a group of just experts about a particular topic, you are less likely to get a good collective solution or proposed solution to a problem than if you include people who know nothing about it. Uh, other work on the social networks and, the, and what uh, Fowler and Christakis are, are talking about when they talk about social contagion uh, show that your, your social networks, the kind you use face-to-face -face and the kind online have a huge influence on you. That happiness can be contagious in large part and that having a happy network makes you happier and having a network that includes more different people and particularly having a network in which you connect networks um, effectively is, is it's much more valuable for you as an individual and again it helps build these meta networks that are or networks of networks that are, are valuable to others. Monica wanted to make sure that we mentioned your syllabus for NetSmart for higher ed and high school. Okay, Monica, yeah, if you've got a link one there. Second, I'll go, go, yeah. go get the URL for that. Uh, and I, I do have a, a um, syllabus for, oh, and I didn't even get to pedagogy. I, I would like to just at least mention that. Let me get this. Here's the university level syllabus. And what I'm looking for are people who know about teaching high school who can help me fork this to create a high school level uh, syllabus. Oh, um, Sherry Trickle's TED Talk. Well, Sherry Trickle's one of the people I interviewed for this book before her book came out and her book and responding to her book, m much of which I agree with um, is, is part of what we're doing. But my, my response to criticism is that, that evidence-based criticism like Nicholas Carr's and, and Sherry Turkle's is very necessary but it's not sufficient. Knowing that something is broken or that it has pitfalls or um, prices that, to pay for it that we didn't previously know about is not the same as having sufficient knowledge to know what to, what to do about it. So I'm really concentrating on the what to do about it part. Critique is necessary but not sufficient. Without the critique, I think I w you wouldn't be able to sharply look at what kinds of things do we need to know in order to think our way out of some of the problems like information overload and crap overload and, and misinformation and uh, collaboration in um, destructive ways. Poor Anita H. has asked this question twice. She's working in higher ed, and one of her biggest barriers to using the technologies is the firewall settings. She wants to know if you have any suggestions to overcome firewall issues. Uh, no, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm one of those. It's easier to get uh, forgiveness than permission people and fly under the radar. And maybe they won't notice you. I, uh, you mean firewall issues at, in educational institutions? I think that's what she does mean, and she's in higher ed. You know, at um, at Stanford, the IT people came out with a, a rule that said that you cannot compel a student in a required course to use services that are not on Stanford's server. And I think that that's not unique in its policy, which of course, in a, in a, a, a course on digital journalism that I was teaching is insane teaching digital journalists to be prepared for tomorrow without using YouTube or Flickr or Blogger is kind of weird. So you know, I, I understand what the concerns of IT are. They're, they are first and foremost security, which is important, and the privacy of students, which is important, and also the ability to support the things that people are doing. And when you're trying to support what people are doing, you kind of have to put walls there so that people aren't poking through them all the time. But you know what? These days, you can go rogue. You can rent a, a server for five bucks a month somewhere and install your, your, your own software. And yeah, it, it is against the rules. But the, the firewall doesn't prevent you from having access. I enable my students to have privacy in their online 
conversations. You have to log in and use a password to see what they are blogging, for example. But I'm also giving them access to the permissions so that if they want to do that for the world, they can turn that on and off. Knowing where the access to the permissions are is one of the, the skills we need these days. And also, I think I, I owe that liberty to them. They, uh, protecting them from the world that they have to live in, I don't think is, is good education. But I understand that there are legal and regulatory and bureaucratic requirements for not punching through the firewalls. Howard, we've reached the end of our hour. I'm clapping for you, which is not the hand-raised icon, but feel free to use that if it helps you. Um, you hover over the smiley face and you go down to applause. Howard, this has been terrific. The book is Net Smart: How to Thrive Online. Uh, I have to say uh, my recommendation here is go buy this book right away. Just a terrific, deep book, um, well worth uh, your time. Coming up on the Future of Education tomorrow, Joseph Granny, the author, talks to us as well. Howard, thanks so much for being here tonight. Well, it was entirely my pleasure, and I will, I will spread the word when I get the recording. The link. <laughs> Really terrific. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks for the good questions. Thanks again to Howard Rheingold. Take care, everybody. Have a great night or day, depending on where you are. We appreciate your participating.